April 2011 is the 50th anniversary of the first man in space um, and the first complete orbit of the Earth by a manned spacecraft. It also was the first example where we were actually able to use the sort of theory of orbits to actually, uh, for a practical application, to actually put somebody into space. The person in question was a uh, uh, Soviet, I was about to call him a Russian, but of course at the time they were Soviets, a guy called Yuri Gagarin. So he, he uh, launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome um, in Kazakhstan and headed to the east. And actually almost all satellites and uh, spacecraft get launched to the east because that's the way the Earth's rotating. So you actually kind of get a kick from the Earth's rotation, which helps you on your way. Um, and then flew all the way around the Earth, came back, across the Pacific round uh, and then landed fairly close to where he launched in the first place. If you look at it on a map, he doesn't actually quite get back to where he started. And so you might think he hadn't completed a complete orbit of the Earth, but of course in the meantime, while he was flying around, the Earth had been rotating. And so actually where he landed was sort of directly where he took off in the first place. It's just the Earth had me moved a bit in the meantime. So it's a bit difficult to see these things on a map because of course what he was really doing was flying above the circular globe of the Earth and was following more or less a sort of a, a, a circular orbit around the Earth. But of course, as soon as you unwrap that and have to project it onto a flat piece of paper to make a map, you always end up with these rather strange looking bendy paths. But actually his orbit was reasonably simple. It was cl quite close to a circle around the Earth. So in fact, although this was the first time that anyone had actually put this theory into practice, the ideas go back on a very long way. And really the first person who uh, had figured out what orbits were about was Isaac Newton. It was actually part of his Principia where he figured out the nature of gravity and so on. Along the way in that, he figured out how orbits actually work. And it was actually him thinking about the way that gravity works and on the orbit of the moon, which actually led to his full understanding of gravity in the first place. And he had a rather neat sort of analogy he used, a sort of a thought experiment he did to explain how orbits actually work, which is his thought experiment was if you took a cannon and hauled it up to the top of a very high mountain and fired the cannonball out horizontally, what he knew is it would go forward and it would sort of fall slowly to earth. Okay? If you then put more gunpowder into the cannon, and crank things up a bit and fired the cannonball, it would obviously it would go a bit further before it fell to earth. But the other thing he realized that actually it would even go a little bit further than you're expecting, because as the cannonball falls towards the earth, of course the, there is a curvature to the earth as well that's kind of falling away. So the cannonball actually goes even further before it finally catches up with where the ground is. And, and his great leap was to say, okay, so let's put even more gunpowder into the, this cannon, and if I fire it with enough force, then the cannonball will indeed be falling to Earth, but the curvature of the Earth will guarantee that the cannonball falls kind of towards the Earth at exactly the same rate that the Earth is falling away. And so although the cannonball is always falling towards the Earth, it never gets any closer to the Earth because the Earth's curvature is taking it away from where it might land at the same rate. What happens if you put even more gunpowder in? If you put a little bit more gunpowder in, you'll end up on an elliptical orbit. Originally, you're, initially, you'll kind of head away from the Earth, and then eventually you'll come back around again. So you'll follow an ellipse rather than a circle. And if you put even more gunpowder in than that, then you'll actually escape from the Earth entirely and eventually go into deep space. The reason why this was only kind of a thought experiment and rather, rather than an actual practical experiment is because it turns out, well, there's two things. Firstly, if you actually did this at the top of a mountain, it wouldn't work because air resistance would slow down your cannonball more than anything else. And so the cannonball would heat up and slow down and fall to earth. So you can't put things into orbit that close to the ground just because the Earth's atmosphere kind of heats up whatever's flying through them and, and stops it staying in orbit. But the other problem is sort of a more practical one, that if you actually figure out how fast you'd actually need your cannonball to emerge from the gun in order to go around on this orbit, in this sort of low Earth orbit where you're very close to the Earth, it's about six kilometers per second it needs to be going at. And in fact, a modern bullet, rifle bullet, goes at about one kilometer per second. So this is a, you know, much faster than anything you could actually practically do with a cannon then, but even with a gun now, it really wouldn't work. So the trick is obviously to get away from the atmosphere, which is causing all this friction. Um, so that's what the first part of the trick. And then the other part of the trick is to have something that, that gets you up to these ridiculously high speeds of six or seven kilometers per second. And that needed the invention of the rocket engine, which really provides, rather than with a cannon, you get this single pulse of, that, that boosts you to a certain speed, but a rocket really allows you to kind of drive up to high, high enough speeds to really go into orbit. It, it, it was a truly astounding ach achievement, um, but obviously one of the things that people were kind of excited about was whether, this, whether he really had completed an orbit. But it turns out there are actually rules. It's bizarre, and I, mean, I found out about this, that even in 1961, somebody had made up rules as to what would constitute this achievement. And one of the rules, for whatever reason they'd come up with, was the fact that the astronaut had to stay in their spacecraft the entire journey and land in their spacecraft, so take off in it and land in it. And one of the things that actually happened, it was you know, part of the design of the mission, was that Gagarin actually parachuted out. He c c completed re-entry, and then before the thing hit the ground, he actually parachuted out, because it was deemed safer to land on a parachute than to land in the space probe. Um, and of course, officially, this means that he wouldn't have broken the record. He wouldn't have achieved the first orbit of the Earth. 
And the Soviets actually lied about this for a long time. For about a decade afterwards, they pretended that he'd actually landed in the spacecraft, and he was made to say that he'd landed in the spacecraft, and so on. So they got the record officially given to them. And only about in, in the 1970s did they actually admit, well, actually, he parachuted out, by which point nobody really cared very much. So Gagarin was on what was known as a low Earth orbit, because really at the time all you could do was get a rocket just above the atmosphere, and that gets you into an orbit that's kind of the lowest one that you can do around the Earth a couple of hundred kilometers up. Um, and when you're that couple of hundred kilometers up, it only, it's actually not that far around the Earth, and you're going very fast. Um, so it works out that it takes about 90 minutes to go around the Earth. But obviously you can go into orbit, in principle, at any distance away from the Earth. Um, and so there's a whole series of different orbits that get used nowadays. Perhaps the most famous is a thing called the geostationary orbit, where if you get up to about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, the speed at which you need to go around gets slower as you get further away, because the pull of gravity is getting smaller, um, and actually you've got further to go, so actually it takes longer to complete the orbit as well. Um, and at this magic distance of 36,000 kilometers, an orbit takes exactly 24 hours, or 23 hours and 57 minutes, or, you know, so basically exactly a day which means that you're staying above the same point. So as you go around, you're going around the Earth at exactly the same speed that the Earth is rotating, which means you stay above the same point on the Earth the entire way around. And that's very useful for things like communication satellites where you want them to stay above their ground station, or maybe weather satellites where you want to be monitoring a particular part of the Earth. And so that's a particularly useful orbit. And then, of course, if you take it even further, if you go out to 400,000 uh, kilometers, then it actually takes about 28 days to go around entirely. And of course, that's the distance the moon is away from us. And the reason why a month is around 28 days is that's how long it takes the moon to complete one complete orbit of the Earth. And that was really what Newton's great achievement in all this was, was tying all this stuff of thinking about gravity at the surface of the Earth and then applying it to the gravity at the distance of the moon and, and realizing they were really different aspects of the same thing. All the things like the International Space Station, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and those kinds of things, they're all in low Earth orbits. Really the only orbit that the Space Shuttle can get up to is this low Earth orbit. It can't go any higher than that. So anything that's been delivered into the space by the Space Shuttle and hasn't had a booster rocket to take it up to a higher orbit will end up in one of these low Earth orbits.